Hey guys. You wonder why I spent so much time in the shop? My son had friends over. Yeah, I'm gonna go back to grinding. Hey guys, this is Eric Weingarner with Weingarner Racing. Um, I'm gonna do a little video today. This is about um, my 10XR I had one of them. Uh, in case you're familiar uh, at all with the Engine Master Contest that took place between 2007 when I entered, and I think the last one I did was 2014. So it's been about seven years ago. The competition actually went longer. I just stopped doing it. But for those that aren't familiar with it, let me just explain, because that's what these heads were for. It was a competition that the magazine Popular Hot Rodding had put on. And the idea of the contest was that you would build an engine and then you would go to a place and everybody would dyno their engines on the dynos there instead of having like what we have now where the internet can claim that the horsepower number is really good for somebody's dyno when in reality it's just not that good in other words how good of an engine builder really are you is about making power or are you just lying about your dyno numbers that was kind of the idea of the contest so builders across the country, and actually a um, few came from outside the world, I think, um, other countries in other words, would bring engines to the contest and we would dyno them. And they had weird uh, parameters. It wasn't peak horsepower. So if, like you made peak horsepower, you wouldn't win. It was usually an RPM range and whoever had the most average horsepower in that RPM range, um, also within this cubic inch, Horse, I should say, it was really complicated to be honest with you as far as scoring goes. Because it'd be average horsepower, usually it's from 2,500 to 6,500 RPM. Is that, let me back up. Average horsepower and average torque um, from 2,500 to 6,500 RPM. And then use some of the times it was also divided by how big your engine was. So it was actually the horsepower per cubic inch average between 25 and 6,500 RPM. If that sounds confusing, it kind of was. And it made the... If you the when they printed it in the con in the contest in the magazine, it made it more confusing because you could have an engine that finished first and say made 600 horsepower, but someone might finish 10th and they made 700, and you couldn't figure out what happened. Well, anyway, the the idea really was we want to see how make a broad power range, and and that's how you would win. Now they had some weird rules that kept changing throughout the years, and that's probably why it lost some of its peels. Like for instance. When I first got there, you had to run a flat tap at camshaft, 10 to one compression ratio. Your headers actually had to fit an actual car. Um, in other words, you brought headers with you, but they had to fit some kind of chassis. The oil pan also had to fit a car. Then later times they changed it, and it used to be one carburetor too, dual, uh, yeah, one carburetor. Then they changed it to, you know, you can run two carburetors and now you can run headers that fit anything as long as on the dyno. And it was like, ah, you're, as long as your oil pan doesn't go past your uh, engine block rails, you're cool. Um, and so in other words, really, and then it went to roller cams and then it was like, okay, this much lift on your cam. And then it was, well, let's make an extreme one because for the most part for the rules on the heads, because I'm going to get to, I promise. If you're running a small block Chevy head, you were limited to one, you couldn't vary the valve angle by plus or one plus or minus one degree from factory, which was 23, so you could go to 22. Uh, these are actually like 22. Um, let's see what else. You could change the valve spacing if you wanted. You could run raised runner heads, except for that kind of wet weird. Sometimes you, you could do it as long as you didn't run spacer plates, and they limited the amount of gaskets you run. And then some years you could run spacer plates, so it all varied. Anyway, this was the head I started developing in 2008 and didn't get to use it until 2012. So, and the rules kept changing. So like, why you do it? Because I noticed that the head rules really, for the most part, didn't change. And it took a while to come up with this. Um, but anyway, and it was also, you could argue, well, the All Pro is a better raised runner head for a 23 degree. And it was, but this was more affordable. So anyway, back to the head. Uh, 10x ri but it's a special casting because if you get a 10x ri the gas it's usually they're not raised up near this much it's a special casting and that's another thing i had to have a, anybody could order it uh, to make the rules now this one actually has standard exhaust ports you were not allowed to run the spread port exhaust because it didn't come that way from the factory um as far as gm factory the head itself's been on the, it was on a 406 and the highest place i ever finished in the engine masters 
was with this with this head and it finished um, sixth out of 20 and um, that was in 2012 it had an outstanding power curve and everything else it, I knew it was gonna be good it made um, 616 horsepower at home it made six or sorry 616 at the contest 622 at home the torque was 574 foot pounds of torque though this is 11 half to one pump gas deal limited to 7 650 lift and a 750 carburetor so pretty good really strong torque curve and what i mean by that is i think that year we're going 2500 to 6500 rpm it had 474 foot pounds of torque at 2500 rpm that's the reason why it did so well it wasn't the peak power the torque came in strong hard early but anyway the ports may look big but they're really not so what I did is I raised it up as much as I could. I did not want to uh, make more cross-sectional area by lowering it down. Instead, I made it really wide. And matter of fact, this takes a 750 offset. So anyway, when I first did it, the heads, I think it was, when we first put them on there and did it for that competition, they only flowed 340. Anyway, flash for the engine gets sold to my cousin. He runs it in his truck. It does really well. He loves it. It's in for a refresh. It's been here for a year. I'm that far behind. That's why I don't build engines anymore because I really don't have time. Anyway, I did some changes to the heads and I'm going to show you this, but the biggest thing I'm going to show you in this video is the change in the manifold. If you're like, I stuck around for six minutes, you didn't got anything. You're right, but I wanted to get to the beginning so you know what that, what the hell this head is even about. So let's start with the stock flow. This is the flow numbers now. If my computer will pull up, there we go. This is the intake flow. So it's not bad. So yes, my like there's some heads that for sure will do better than this, but this is really, really small. To give you an idea of this cross-sectional area on this, and it doesn't look this way at all. That's 2.51 inches. Um, so it's pretty it's really small. Um, great for torque and stuff. And this guy's only gonna go about 7,000 RPM. And I don't know that it'll make power there. Um, I think on the dyno on this last camshaft, we made it at 6,600 RPM. This might make it 68. Anyway, small changes got it here. It's about 10 CFM better than what it was. But the reason for the video is this. I've got a bunch of intake manifolds, which I'll show you that one in a minute. This was the manifold that I ran for the competition. Okay? He is clearly around this way more often. This is a Dart. I don't even think they... Dart doesn't make anything anymore, but... This was a raised runner manifold, and I had to uh, use a ton of epoxy. By the way, sometimes years you couldn't put epoxy in the manifold. Um... But the rules allowed it for this year that it competed in. And I put a ton of epoxy in it, filling up the floor, filling up the plenum volume to make the shape right. I added actually the clover leaf to keep everything tight because you really wanted a strong booster signal. You wanted things um, as efficient as possible to build the torque. So it might have limited horsepower. Now, this is what it was running before, and I'm going to flow it with this attached. So you just saw the flow numbers without it. I'm going to flow it with this one, but this is not the one we're going to use on the dyno this time. Part of it is I used quick steel epoxy. It's not the best, but that's what I used because in the dyno competition, it really didn't matter. And I didn't think any of it would come out as thick as it was. But you can see a chunk missing there. There's actually a slight piece missing there, um, which is weird because it did no damage to the engine. And just to give you an idea how much raise up I'm talking, you can see the epoxy. Now, the thing I really liked about the manifold, to be honest with you, is this. This is the end rail, but they have way more material. So I didn't have to run a spacer underneath here to get the china wall to seal up. However, because that epoxy is coming out, and I was more worried, I wanted to try a different manifold. Well, because the runners are so raised up, there's only a few choices. Um, this one I could do again, but again, epoxy, and I could use a different one, I'm sure it'd be fine. But to avoid it, this is what I'm using. This is the Brodix MS-91. It's actually made to fit the headhunter heads. And as you, it actually had a clover leaf, and I'll show you what it looks like. It looks like this stock. Okay. It looks like this now. I took out the clover. I was going to leave it in, but I was like, no, just do without it. Um, I don't think it's going to help on his deal racing. It probably helped in the competition, but didn't otherwise. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flow it with this attached. Okay. Then I'll flow it with the old one, and then I'm going to flow it with the stock one. Now this one I'm going to show you because if you keep watching my videos, you can see something interesting with this. There. This is going to be used for a set of headhunters that I'm getting ready to port. 
um, as soon as I get through some of the other stuff in front of it, and uh, this will be the manifold. This one's gonna have some heavy duty work done because you can tell, well, that's a lot of weld. I should point out, I did have to weld this one too. But as you can tell, the other manifold, this one, all that got welded in. So it's flat from here down compared to this one where it's dug in. So this one will be cool to see when it's done. So pay attention to the videos. But I'm gonna float with this one too, just see how much it hurts. I should point out, this is not gonna be a total fair comparison because that's the size of their holes. Now, if you look at this one, I've got so much crap here. No epoxy, but no epoxy and it's raised up. So we get ready to pop this on the bench and I'll show the results. Okay, I'm gonna show you what it looks like when I flow it just real quick before I show you the numbers. I just got done flowing it, by the way. You're like, what did you do? Here's what it is. This is an HVH um, spacer. But it's one that's made for uh, a 4500 top, but a 4150 carburetor. Because the way this combo works, and I couldn't do this in the master, by the way. But the way this combo works is this has a um, spacer that flares out, so it's for a 4500 top. But um, the bolt's made in the dominator location, the 4500. And what you do is you take, in this case, the way he runs it, he has a, um, a quick fuel... 950 and it's got slots on it so you can run on either a dominator or a 40 or a 4150 and that's how he runs it so he runs this spacer plate and you have to run this spacer plate because otherwise your linkage will hit here and you can't open it so there's have to be something here and it clears that's the reason for it the reason for the top is it's a sharp edge right here and it's still got some as you can clearly tell um but this is kind of just to simulate the air entry the carburetor pretend there's a booster there and it goes through this is closer to what a carburetor would be. I just don't have a carburetor base. You might say, why don't you use your sniper deal? The sniper is a 4150 um, bolt pattern, so it won't fit on this. So anyway, let's look at the numbers. Here you can look at the graph. See that blue line? That's with the that's the intake manifold right there. And this is without it. So you can see quite a bit of difference. It starts, you know, almost instantly. However, it's really good flow still. It's flowing 332. Now granted, that's at peak. Um, through the manifold and it's through the same port, which is this one. Now this port, by the way, I, I always flow the head on this port anyway, but it's probably gonna be one of the worst flowing ones. The outer ones, you've got more of a straight shot. It's, it's a better design. The inside ones usually get starved. So still 333 CFM, not bad. This should be pretty good. Um, as far as single planes go, that's the highest one I've seen currently that's been on my flow bitch. Um, the other one that's going to be done for the head under probably I'll do it. Now I'm going to do is attach the dart and flow it. Okay, now I flowed this one the same way I did the last one. But I will point out, and I'm going to get my flashlight so you can see this. If you look in the runners, dart has a different runner on the um, one side versus the other. For instance, this one's straight down. That one's got like an elephant ear. So anyway... And this is how it was dyno. So people would say all they like about it, maybe it'd be a knife edge. But that thing made great power and torque. Um, thought probably not ideal. I don't know that I'd do that again. I remember that's almost 10 years ago. Probably wouldn't do it that way anymore. That thin there. But anyway, um, because the other ones aren't. And I can't remember if it came pretty thin and then when I opened it up, it was just the way it was. I really don't remember. But anyway, there's that. Let's see how it flowed. If I turn off this light. So we'll do the graph first because some of you want to see this. You see this blue line here? This is the one that the dart. This line right above it is the Brodex one that was is replacing it. And this is without any of the intakes attached. So yeah, it did it lost as you could tell. Which um, I honestly I'm pretty happy because I'd feel bad if I did all that work on this one and it was worse than this. So um, it should be some kind of gain. Here's the raw numbers. So now it's down to 324, so it's a good bit 10 CFM smaller. I should point out though, this is a smaller intake because it's got all that material on the floor that you now can't see. Turn on the flashlight again. And it's also got all that up there at the top for the clover. It's a more efficient design. In other words, there's no dead areas or anything like that, but it's definitely a smaller plenum area and the cross section's slightly smaller, and I mean do mean slightly. So 
Uh, the Brodex is a better one, so I feel better about that. But going back to this, because I want to show you this. This is where it was, like I said, the China reel. But if you compare that to this Brodex one, that's thin. I have to add spacers, and I don't like that. So I still have to do that. i probably going to tap into that or weld one on. But anyway, there's that. So one more intake to go, and that's the stock version of this. So there's that. We're going to put this one on. Nothing's been done. I mean, it's been welded, but that ain't gonna affect it, none of that at all. So I'm gonna bolt it on and see how bad or good it is. All right, last clip. Intake, not ported. There you go. Same, float the same way. And I float it um, from 200 all the way to one inch. Okay, let's look at the numbers. Look at the graph first. Yeah, I'm not making that up. Pointer, there you go. See this blue line? This is the unported intake. So you have top line up here that I'm pointing to. This would be the just the head, the ported Brodex intake, ported hard intake, stock Brodex intake. Like, well, how much how much flow is that? That. It dropped it all the way down from a head that flows 350 to 265. So that's all this intake manifold will move right now, period. Um, a point I make with this though is, I don't know how many people out there right now spend a ton of money buying CNC ported heads or some ported heads. I think the most common one I see is they'll buy a set of AFR, say 227s, 235s, AFR 220 is probably the most common. And what do they put on it? A stock Super Victor 2925. They took a head that flowed 300 and made it flow 250. Um, this is the reason why, and I'm, it sounds like a salesmanship thing here, but look, the numbers don't lie. That If you just bolt on an intake as cast one, you, this is what you get. It's the reason why we, pay, we have them ported. It makes no sense to spend all the time on the head, not focus on the intake. So anyway, you will get to see this one finished though because this intake's gonna get a lot of work done. You'll see it float on the headhunter. It's gonna have quite a bit of work done, so this will be neat to see, see how much of a difference it made. Anyway, thanks for sticking around for this video. I'm gonna do one more tomorrow, and it's not car related, and it'll be like a Christmas one. And if you like it, great. If you don't, um, sorry. Anyway, thanks for watching, take care.